darkness tries to roll over my bones and sorrow comes to steal the joy I own brokenness and pain is all I know but I won't be shaken but I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Dream no longer has a place to hide. Captive to the light. I'm not afraid to leave my path behind, but I won't be shaken. No, I won't be Welcome to New Life. We're so glad you're joining us. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I'm here. And most of all, I'm glad that God is here with us this morning. And uh, so what I, let me ask you just to put your hands out like this and, and, uh, and pray along with me. God, may, may the things that we worry about, may the things that we're holding on to that drag us down, God, may we not carry these today, God. May we be empty, empty vessels for you this morning, God. We pray that we are filled with what you have for us this morning. The peace and the grace and the hope and the quiet calling of your love, God. May we be filled with those things. May we not come expecting what we think you are like, God, but may you, may you show us so much more. May we continue to worship you and sing about your great love.
sing a song of love never fails. Nothing can separate me, even if I ran away. Your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. Sometimes it's hard to believe it when you're in the middle of all of it. But remember how good God is. Remember his great love. And 
how he's been there before. Cause you make all things work together for my good. Cause you make all things work together for my good. Cause you make all things work together for my good you make all things work together for my good hey new life uh, this is the first weekend of the month and like we do every first weekend of the month it's our time to take communion together so uh, wherever you are whether you're watching from home or your bedroom uh, or maybe listening online uh, during your lunch break or whatever at work we just want to encourage you that if you're able to uh, go and grab some elements and join us as we uh, take the Lord's Supper uh, this weekend and uh, we'll give you just a few minutes to do that. You can actually even push pause right now if you forgot about it or if you say, hey, you know, I've got some elements and we just want to do it as a family. So go ahead and push pause in the video and then uh, we'll wait just a second for you to come back. All right, hopefully by now you've gotten some elements uh, to take for communion. We just want to walk through those uh, very quickly. We love doing this as, as a faith family, and uh, we love doing this uh, as a community, uh, which is what one of the derivatives of the word commune means uh, to do this together. So thank you so much for joining us in this. Uh, go ahead and take whatever you chose to represent the body of Christ. We here at New Life, we take this little wafer here. And in Scripture, Jesus talks about uh, on the, the scripture says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, the loaf of bread that was in front of him, and he tore off a piece, and then he began to pass it around to his disciples. And he said, as I am tearing off a piece of this loaf, and as you are tearing off a piece of this loaf of bread, imagine it being a representative uh, of my body being torn and broken for your sicknesses and diseases. So we just want to pray over that right now. We don't believe that anything weird happens when we take communion here at New Life. We believe that it's just a representation of what we can receive. And so as we eat this wafer, we just believe that if you're suffering from any sicknesses or diseases, that just know that Christ allowed his body to be broken for those. So let's pray over the wafer, and then we'll take it together. Father, thank you so much for allowing your body to be broken for our sicknesses and our diseases. Father, we believe that as we, as we ingest this wafer, Lord, that we can receive healing for what you did 2,000 years ago. So as we do that, Lord, let us receive exactly what you died for, what, exactly what you allowed your body to be broken for. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat together. And in the same manner, Jesus took his cup of wine, and he took a sip, and then he began to pass it uh, around to his disciples. And he said, this wine represents my blood that's going to be shed as a sacrifice for your sin. No longer will you have to come and bring an animal to a priest and have it sacrifice and allow that blood to cover your sin because my blood is going to be shed and cover your sin. And that's what this juice represents, or whatever you're, whatever you're uh, drinking there. Uh, to represent the blood of Christ. So let's pray over that. Father, thank you so much for shedding your blood. Lord, it's that atoning uh, sacrifice, that once and for all sacrifice for our sins, past, present, and future, Lord Jesus, that you allowed your blood to pour out onto the ground as the ultimate sacrifice, Lord. Thank you for that, God. And we receive that. We receive that sacrifice. We believe that you were sent here by your Father, to pay that price for the debt that we owed, but you paid it for us. We believe that. We receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink together. Well, continue worshiping with us as the band comes back and sings one more song. I've been new to some of you, it's called Holy Water. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. I need you. 
eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me No, oh, how he loves us so and oh how he loves us how he loves us all. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us.
Hey, I want to thank you for joining us again this weekend. Can you believe it? It is November, and we are heading into a, a new season, a new time, but I'm glad that you've come to join us this weekend. And thanks for engaging in worship, more than just being a spectator, because uh, worship is really about what's going on in our hearts. And it's not just about music. It's not just about tunes. It's not just about those things, but engaging our hearts with God. And I want to invite you to do that as we've done through music, but now as we enter into God's Word. So a couple things as we get going. One, love for you to grab your phone, text someone, let them know that you're thinking about them, that you're praying for them, just a little way to encourage them. Uh, also, there are resources available online or through our app. Make sure you do that. You can get a note-taking sheet, stuff for kids kids, students, all that's available there. Also, you can text the word prayers to 30500. Uh, and we take those as soon as they come in, distribute them to our staff team, and we're praying for you. Also, if you want to keep up on what's going on, text the word update to 30500. Zero, zero. You'll see it on the screen below me, and uh, you can kind of keep up to date with all the different things that are happening. Uh, you know, for, for Gina and I, one of the ways that we respond back in worship to the Lord is through giving, and we do that online. We've set it up as a regular part of our worship and our faith and our growing in Christ, and I want to encourage you to do that as well, whether you do it through our app, whether you do it online, whether you choose to, to mail it in, send it in, whatever that looks like for you. You. Just know this, as we respond to God in faithfulness and in obedience and generosity, the Bible says that he pours out blessings, and that's that kind of act of, of giving and receiving. And so thank you for your, your faithfulness in that. Thank you for trusting God in that. Thank you for trusting us as a church family in that. Your faithfulness allows us to, uh, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to respond through things like our food pantry and various other ways that we just re reach out and meet the needs of so many in our community. So thank you for that. And right before we jump into this message, I just want to remind you of our three lanes. These are so important. Uh, many of you are in lane one, which is uh, New Life at Home, and you're watching this uh, just with, by yourself or with your family, uh, maybe just even on your phone, whatever it might be. But there's a lane for you to grow in, and for some of you, it may be lane one. For some of you, lane two is New Life with Friends, and you're gathering together you're, you're sharing life together as well as growing together. This is a great opportunity uh, for you to do that. For some of you, you've, you've, you're in lane three, and we are doing our live services on the weekend. We've moved inside, and it's Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 right now, but... Um, that could change, but that's where we're at, at at this moment. And so I realize that some people are moving from one to two to three. Some people are moving from three back to two or one based on your circumstances. Wherever you are is great. Like I said earlier, God has a lane for you to grow in. And I want you to be at the place where God has you you can learn from him, you can lean into him, that you can grow in Christ as all together as a family, we fulfill this mission of, of taking one step closer to Jesus. So as we dive into this message today, I'd love for you to get your note sheet out, I'd love for you to get your Bible out, and uh, I want you to turn today to the book of Matthew chapter 6. We're in this series about the Lord's Prayer, and uh, let me just pray as we get started. Jesus, today we invite you to be our teacher Lord, not Dave, not anything that I have, but Lord, you. We want to hear from you. And it's so crazy to think, Lord, that whether we're watching this on a phone or on a television or on a, a tablet, you're here with us. And so, Lord, speak to our hearts, challenge us, invite us in close. Lord, we want more than a lesson today. We want to really know you. So we thank you for this in your name. Amen. Well, last week I shared with you how guilt can be like a heavy backpack, and the burden of that guilt can be devastating and rob us of God's peace and of the life that he offers. Uh, I shared with you the story of backpacking and these kids that I was with and all the canned foods and how sometimes we just have to let go of that heavy stuff. Well, when it comes to guilt, God is inviting us to live in this place of being forgiven, experiencing his grace, and that is such a, a, a peace-filled place to be. But there's another weight and burden that we often carry as well, and it's the weight of resentment that comes when we don't forgive others. 
So, so the guilt that we have comes from what, what we do or what we have done that we, that we carry, but resentment comes from what has been done to us. And we get, uh, again, angry and resentful and frustrated because of the things that have hurt us and wounded us. Last week I shared that the only antidote to guilt is to receive the forgiveness of God. That's why in this Lord's Prayer, uh, he says that, you know, forgive us our sins, you know, the, the things that we have done. And in the same way, the only antidote to resentment is to give forgiveness. Just as we've been set free, we can set others free. A number of years ago, there was a friend of mine uh, named Jack, and I had never been uh, water skiing before. I'd been snow skiing, I'd done that for years, but I'd never water skied, and he had a boat. And so we were out on the lake, and, and I'd been watching, you know, people just pop up and water ski, and it seemed like a lot of fun. And so he said, okay, we're going to teach you how to do this. So you're a little bit bigger, and I am. I'm six foot five, I'm 200 plus, all those things. He says, so what you have to do is just hold on and stay underwater. Just hold on. And so, you know, if you've ever water skied, I, I had the, the, the rope and I, you know, I was all tucked in in place and the skis out in front. And he starts taking off in the boat. And man, I am just drinking the lake at this point. And I tried to stand up several times and there wasn't enough speed in the boat. So at one point, I had kind of flipped over and I was being dragged around the lake. My legs are behind me. Skis had come off, but I'm just holding on and just, you know, in the water doing this. And the rope was finally just kind of ripped from my hands and the boat circled around and came back. And my friend looked at me and said, dude, it's okay to let go. It's okay to let go. By the way, I finally did ski, and you'd think with size 15 feet, I could have done it barefoot, but alas, that's never happened. But my friend's words, just let go, ring so true as we look at this next part of Jesus' prayer. It's okay to let go. It's a prayer to release people. It's a prayer to forgive people. Just as God has released and forgiven me, so here are the words in Matthew 6, 12. Jesus says this, and forgive us our sins, that's what we looked at last week, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Now, depending on your tradition, you maybe grew up saying, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But it comes down to this same basic thing that we're looking for God's grace to forgive our sins as we forgive those who have wronged or sinned against us. And it seems like more and more lately that people are at odds with one another, just in case you haven't noticed. The fact is, is that all of us are flawed individuals who seem to kind of be in competition with one another to be right, to be correct. And when we're not right or someone doesn't see our point or our perspectives don't align with one another, our first response often can be to lash out, to fight back, to go on the offensive or to say or do or post something that kind of brings them back into line and it hurts. My wife Gina was listening to a podcast a week or so ago and she came across this quote that has just kind of stuck in my mind, especially during these volatile times. And the quote was this, be careful who you hate because it just may be somebody that you love. Now, does it mean we can't have an opinion, that we can't express a perspective? Does it mean we have to be silent? Does it mean we have to just simply be a doormat? No. But how how we go about doing these things, how we go about sharing and acting and posting, how we go about living matters. And during these times when there is so much that polarizes us and so much that divides us, Jesus is inviting us into something different. A relationship with a father who is present and kind and powerful. He invites us in this Lord's Prayer to give up my way for his way. To pray, let your kingdom be present and your will be done in me just as it is in heaven. 
to lean into a father who loves me deeply and provides for me what I need today, this moment, and then a grace-filled father who forgives me and sets me free instantly, repeatedly, freely, and completely. And then, and here's where we're at today, he invites me to live free, not just to experience that kind of freedom, but to live free by forgiving and releasing those who have wronged me, those who've hurt me, those who've wounded me. And I know that's not easy. It can, it can kind of cut right to the core of who we are, but, but there's something in this. See, see, it's all tied together. These aren't just isolated statements that Jesus is inviting us into. There's this completeness and wholeness to it. So remember Jesus' words, backing up just a few in Matthew 6, verse 9. He said, pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food that we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Experiencing forgiveness and offering forgiveness here's the deal. I need them both. And you need them both. I can't tell you how many times that I've walked away from a conversation and thought to myself, I can't believe I just said that. Or I can't believe I just did that. And I know that my words or my actions hurt someone. But I've also walked away from conversations saying, I can't believe they said that to me. Or I can't believe that they they did that to me. Two sides of the same coin. Whether it's in our marriages, our careers, our friendships, or other relationships, someone along the line is going to hurt us. We know this. Someone is going to cause us pain. Someone's going to mentally or emotionally kind of knock the wind out of us. Here's the here's the thought. Have have you ever been hurt by someone? who actually has no idea that they hurt you? Of course you have. Me too. Which then makes me wonder how many people I've hurt, and yet I have no idea. See, Jesus keeps this prayer so simple for us, doesn't he? It's so concise. It's not complicated. It's not all the ins and outs. It's so simple that he's asking us to forgive And the implication is, whether it's intentional or whether it's unintentional, that we get to live in a place of freedom. Remember, throughout Jesus' ministry, the disciples were constantly watching and listening to how he responded to all these situations in life. Things like how he paid taxes. They were watching that. How he cared for the sick, how he responded to the needy, how he interacted with those who were were struggling with uh, fatal diseases. They watched how he observed the Sabbath, how he engaged in spiritual things, how he found things like rest. They watched how he dealt with anger and false accusations against him. He watched, or they watched him as, as people dishonored the temple. And, and how was he going to respond to that? They, they watched him as, as there were injustices against people who were marginalized and had no voice. They were, they were right there watching and listening to him. Just, just like a kid who, who follows their parents or, or follows an adult around to, to see what they're doing and to kind of watch and observe them. My grandson, he's two and a half years old, and he was with us about a week or so ago. And Gina and I were working on this little renovation project in our basement. And he was watching me use the tape measure. He was watching me as I marked the wood. And he would put on his ear protectors when I used the saw. And he was busy, busy, busy. And he was watching and working right alongside me. But kids and grandkids are watching more than just how to use a tape measure. And more than just our kids, as important as that is, our community and our very culture is listening to how we talk and the language we use. As as followers of Christ, they're, they're tuning into that. What do we say about people? And what are we saying about events? What are we saying about our leaders? 
They're watching to see how we respond and how we treat others, how we show respect to those that we disagree with. So how does this simple prayer of Jesus to forgive others take root in us? Let me give you a few things and I want you to write this down. The first is this. Praying to forgive others demonstrates God's forgiveness for me. Praying to forgive others demonstrates God's forgiveness for me. The Apostle Paul wrote this in the book of Colossians. He said, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Now, the Apostle Paul is being pretty straightforward here, and he isn't giving us any excuses because Paul is a person who was beat up repeatedly. He was left for dead. Now, we know that he wrote many of the, of the letters and the books in the New Testament. Do you realize that, that many of those were written from prison? I mean, not a, not a fun place to be. And you look at why he was thrown in prison. It was for doing the right thing, for, for speaking life and truth, and yet he was in chains for that. He'd also been shipwrecked. He would, had been bitten by a snake. He was attacked by mobs. He was betrayed by colleagues and friends. And then he goes to say this, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. And then, of course, these powerful words, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Notice in this Lord's Prayer that we read, he says, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. It's almost a cause and effect with that word as, right? Remember last week we discussed our need for forgiveness and we read the line, and forgive us our sins. Jesus adds the word as we have forgiven those who sin against us. There's this expectation from God that we do this, we do this because he has forgiven us. As we ask him to forgive us, then he wants us to respond. Nowhere in this verse does it say, as we have forgiven those who ask for it, or as we have forgiven those who apologize, or as we have forgiven those when we think about it, or when it's convenient. And you may say, well, Dave, how important is it really that I forgive someone who's wronged me? Well, Paul kind of makes it very clear, but, but how about more than Paul? How about Jesus? Jesus says this, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. And here's where it gets a little chilling. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. I think that's pretty clear, don't you? And I know we can say, but, but Dave, you have no idea what they've done to me. You don't understand the turmoil that they've caused in my life and in my mental health, how much it's cost me financially, the tension and the dissension in my family because of this one person and what they did. Some of you are sitting there going, I've lost sleep, I've lost money, I've lost relationships, I've lost trust, all because of what that person did. How do I forgive that? And you know what? I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to know everything that you're going through. I, I don't understand the nuances of what's been done. I know. But here's what I do know. I know we serve a compassionate Father, right? We've been talking about that, who is also a compassionate healer. And he can actually heal our hearts from the wounds that we've experienced. Does it, does it mean they didn't happen? No, no but it means that he can bring healing. See, I may not know what happened, but God does. In fact, he was right there when, whatever those circumstances are, he was right there when they happened. And I can tell you this, God didn't like it either. He knows the damage that was caused. And God isn't asking you to forgive because it doesn't matter. He's not asking you to just say, oh, it was, it was no big deal, or, or God's just saying, well, just, just get over it. That's not what God is saying at all. He's asking you to release them and let go. You don't have to be judge and jury. You can put those situations, you can put those people in God's hands. He's asking you to forgive because the things that were done do matter. 
That's why forgiveness is needed. Those things do matter. The things that were done, they actually did hurt and they actually caused wounds. And for many of us, those things are still hurting. And maybe it just gives us a tiny picture maybe a little more understanding of what our sin does to the heart of God. I need to forgive because I still need forgiveness. I still need forgiveness. Forgiveness allows me to put that belief in God and trust in God into action, that he is my source, not whether I can wring out some payment or payback from someone, but that he's going to supply what I need. He's going to restore. He's going to heal. And this simple prayer of Jesus leads us to freedom from resentment. And it leads us to peace with God. I'm forgiven and I'm free. And I'm going to forgive just like it's been shown to me. Write this down for number two. Praying to forgive others changes my heart. Isn't that weird? Because we, we kind of think if, if I do this grand act, if I forgive someone, that, oh, it's, it's going to be this huge change for them. But really, forgiveness changes me. When I offer forgiveness, I have no guarantee of what the outcome of that is going to be, whether someone will respond to it or not. Or maybe it's someone I can't even connect with anymore. Sometimes we're still dealing with unforgiveness for, for people who, who've passed away. So there's not even a way to to kind of deal with that or make it happen. But here's the thing. Forgiveness doesn't change that. It changes me. The forgiveness that Jesus is inviting us into is not just a transactional event. I'm forgiven, so thus and therefore I forgive you. Like like this completely uh, business event that we done, you know, kind of deal done, let's move on. That's not what it is. It's a heart issue. Receiving forgiveness and then forgiving others exposes the fractures and the disconnection in me. Remember earlier in this series, I shared with you that God desires for us to experience peace, which is this Hebrew word shalom. And shalom is more than just the absence of conflict. When we think of of peace, it's like, oh, no one's fighting anymore. No one's arguing anymore. But this word shalom is so much more than that. It's about being whole and complete. And when Jesus is modeling for us to pray this forgive others, it's not just a move past conflict, which is a good thing. That's a great thing. But it's to move to a place that makes our hearts and our souls and our very lives whole and complete, not fractured by guilt and resentment and unforgiveness. Jesus actually makes a point of this in an encounter in the book of Matthew. In fact, if you're there in Matthew chapter 6, just flip over a little bit to Matthew chapter 18. And in verse 21, it says, Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, there's a whole thing to that with the rabbinical law and all that, but but here's the main point. Jesus was saying there's simply just no limit to forgiveness. In fact, he would even say, if you're counting, if you're, I'm at number six, am I at number seven? He said, if you're counting, you're actually missing the point. Jesus is letting us know that there is a deeper truth at play. Now, right after this encounter with Peter, Jesus immediately launches into a story, giving some perspective to forgiveness. Uh, If you've been around church for a while, you realize this is a a parable. It's not a true story, but it's a story with a spiritual point. And he's basically telling us about what forgiveness is and really what it means to let go. And he starts off in Matthew 18, uh, verse 23, by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like this. In other words, this is how things work in the, in the rule and authority of God. He said, a king makes a decree and says this, everyone who owes me money, bring, you know, come to this place. We're, we're going to reconcile everything. We're going to settle all the accounts right now. And they bring in this guy who is hopelessly in debt to the king. He owes, the Bible says, 10,000 talents. Now, 
If you have a Bible open with you, you can look, there's a footnote there, depending on what translation. It's millions of dollars, millions of dollars. I actually read a thing where someone had figured out the, the, the modern day equivalent of that many talents, and they figured it out to be about $12 million. I don't know about you, I don't walk around with that kind of debt. I mean, this guy is hopelessly in over his head. He is sinking, and there's no way he's going to get out of it. Now, in those days, bankruptcy was, in some ways, a whole lot simpler, though, though a lot more dramatic than it is today. Back then, you would just simply take this guy, you would throw him in prison, what was called a debtor's prison, and he would have to beg, and everything that he got while in prison would go to pay off. Now, imagine how long that would take. They would throw him in prison, but that wasn't the only thing that they would do. They would take their family and sell them into slavery just to get a little bit back of what, we, what was owed. Pretty dramatic. But that's how it would be handled. But the guy responds this way. He falls on his knees and he cries out to the king. He says, be patient with me and I will pay everything back. Now, there's this sad part to this but also a part that's a little bit funny. The guy's $12 million in debt, and he's basically saying this, whoa, 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 just give me a couple more days. I mean, there's no way he's gonna pay this back. He is totally in over his head. But look at verse 27. It says, the king took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. The king said, we'll just write this off. We'll erase your debt. What's he saying? I forgive you, you can go free and clear. Can you imagine being that guy? Can you imagine the feeling? So imagine this, maybe put this in our terms. Imagine if you were upside down uh, on your home and you are bleeding money. You're barely able to make your house payment, wondering how you're going to get through this. And the bank calls you up and they say, you know, we've been going through our accounts and we just wanted you to know, we just wrote off your house. No repossession, nor, no foreclosure, no more house payments. It's yours, free and clear. <laughs> what would you do with that? I mean, we would, we would be celebrating. We'd be going, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You'd just be cheering. You'd be, you'd be going crazy. I know I would. That's how this guy felt. This huge weight, this burden was finally released. But it's not the end of the story. When this servant who had just been forgiven $12 million, when he left that place celebrating his good fortune and his luck, he found another guy that he knows who owed him 100 denarii, 17 bucks. And it says he grabs him and he starts making demands saying, give me my money back and he starts choking him. Here's a weird little fact. According to Roman law, you were allowed to choke somebody who owed you money. It was kind of like the physical equivalent of, I'm gonna squeeze this out of you somehow. And because this guy can't pay him 17 bucks, he has him thrown into prison, that debtor's prison. Now, why was this guy so harsh? How, how come he couldn't see both of these sides? Here's what I think. In his heart, I wondered if he really believed the king had forgiven his debt. I wonder if he really believed that it was washed clean and let go. It was almost like he was saying, I, I, I know, I, I heard what the king said, but I'm going to pay him back so that I'm not under his thumb. Even if it starts with 17 bucks at a time, I'm going to figure out a way to pay him back. Here's the bottom line. He was unable, or maybe unwilling, to receive grace. No strings attached, just set free. And the reality is, when we feel unforgiven, we tend to be unforgiving. And when we feel we, we're given no grace, we tend to give no grace to others. Because there's a disconnect that happens in our hearts. But God desires that when we lean into him in prayer, 
we experience his forgiveness that changes our own hearts as we receive grace. But then, then the connection is it flows into the relationships around us. Write this down for number three. Praying to forgive others brings God's peace. Anytime you find someone who's really judgmental or critical, who's unforgiving, unbending, rigid, and unloving, no elbows right now, but anytime you experience that, you know what you can probably figure out? There's some unresolved guilt and resentment below the surface. There's a disconnect. There's no peace. And Jesus is offering us true freedom and grace to be given brand new life and to experience it in relationships. To find peace, that shalom, not just the absence of conflict, but a place of wholeness and completeness and contentment. True peace. So to let go and release the people who've hurt you and hurt me we first got to realize that God has forgiven us. We're the ones who've been set free and experienced then the the heart change of that grace. He has wiped out all of my sin. He has wiped out and paid for all of your sin as you put your trust in Christ. And you will never have to forgive anyone else more than God has already forgiven you. I know, we go, but, 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 all these things, all these situations, I know, I know. But I will never have to forgive anyone more than Christ has already forgiven me. Listen to what Paul wrote in Ephesians 4. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Do you see the dual nature of that verse? Here's all this stuff, bitterness, anger, harsh words. And then there's this other side, this other way of living that's on the other side of experiencing forgiveness and offering forgiveness. It's truly the opportunity to live in peace, to be whole and complete in him, That's why Jesus prays this way. That's why he tells his disciples and us to pray like this. Not just words, not just memorization, but to engage and to to lean into life with the Father because there's so much more for us. That we can come to him and we can be set free. And just as we've been released, just as we've been set free from sin, we can release others. So here's my question for you. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to just let go? Remember, it doesn't mean that what happened didn't matter or that it was no big deal. You're not saying that it didn't hurt or didn't cause pain, but you're simply putting them in God's hands and you're trusting him for your healing. Would you pray with me? Father, today we are really kind of in awe that you would forgive us so freely and so completely. And Lord, we had a chance to dive into that last weekend to to know that your forgiveness is instantaneous and it's it's you repeat it again and again and again when we when we fail and it's free and complete. All those things, Lord, that are so hard sometimes to even wrap our our hearts around and our brain around that you would You would love us that much to forgive us. And you also love us too much to want us to live in those places of resentment towards others. God, you want us to be alive. You say in your word that you've come to give us life in abundance, life over the top, life life to the full. And God, I know we can't stay and places where we're rejecting grace or, or where we're holding on to past hurts. Instead, Lord, you want us to look to you as our healer and our father. And we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. There's this old song, and I'm not going to sing it to you, but I'm going to give you the words. Um, 
that is so powerful. And, and I, I, I heard it a, a couple weeks ago. It was actually just the music for it. And it was like, what are the words to that song? And it, it goes this way. It says, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. And what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. So we've been looking at, right? Prayer. Then it says this, oh, what peace we often forfeit and oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I want to challenge you this week to not bear that needless pain and, and just keep trudging down that road, but to take everything to God in prayer. In closing, let me remind you that uh, we're having a night of worship on this Saturday night, uh, November 7th at 6 o'clock. It'll be outside in our grass quad area, and it's called One Voice, and it's going to be multiple churches and a community gathering together. It is not a concert for you to watch. It is a night of worship to engage in, and I hope you'll come join us. You need to bring your own chairs, your own blanket, but come and worship with us this Saturday night at 6 o'clock. Let me leave you with this in 1 Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen. For he who calls you is faithful. Thanks for joining us this weekend.